you know, this was the movie I was looking forward to all year. Uh, we just saw Gravity. <laughs> we saw Interstellar. This was the movie I was hoping and waiting for all year. Me too. Or at least uh, the, the most anticipated film for me since I first heard about it. And um, mm, Not for me. Well, what was the most anticipated film for you so far this year? Ooh. Or all year, rather. Boy. Uh, boy, probably Guardians of the Galaxy. I'm sorry, man. This is just going to keep coming I, up. I, I know. But, uh, yeah, this was the most anticipated movie of the year for me. And uh, with that comes heightened expectations. I mean, you can't not be uh, excited for a movie, but hoping that they meet all, you know, every single... Like, it hits every bullet point with you. It's rare when a movie is gets you all hyped and it not only meets or exceeds expectations. And unfortunately, that's not the case with me for Interstellar. I think I... Gravity. I think I set myself up for a failure for this movie because there's no way that Interstellar could meet my lofty expectations of a movie. And um, it's not to say that it's a bad movie or even a mediocre movie. This is a good, good movie. But uh, this could have been a great movie. Actually, it was better than my expectations. Well, that well, we differ a little bit on Nolan. A little bit. Like, uh, you love Memento. I love Memento, yes. You love Memento. You love uh, The Prestige. Absolutely. You're like, you know, absolutely great films. Uh, but you did not care for Inception. You did not care for... No, I really did not like Inception. Yeah. Mostly because of the hype. I think I would have enjoyed it a lot more if I went into it thinking it was just going to be some thriller action. With a dream twist. Sure. Yeah, but it, uh, no, it was so hyped. So hyped. And this movie we just watched had, uh, you know, an enveloping kind of uh, visual effect like Inception did. And I, uh, it may not have been as pretty as Inception did with the buildings. Mm -hmm. The folding, you know, yeah. uh, you know, like maybe it didn't have quite as uh, big a crew working nonstop just to make that look good. But it, the effect was delivered better in this movie, and it was more interesting. And uh, I don't like Inception that much. I'm sorry. It I, don't. I just don't like it. I mean, I'm not the I'm not the kind of guy who would. Uh... Who would go to bat for Nolan 100% at the time? So you, there's no need to apologize. But I think where you and I differ, on, at least on Inception, is that I don't mind Leonardo DiCaprio in the movie. You just cannot stand the sight of him. I can't stand Leonardo in anything unless he's uh, playing, uh, you know, a pompous dick. Django Which is why I I need to see Wall Street, Wolf of Wall Street. Wolf of I, Wall Street and Django Unchained. I've seen Django Unchained, and I loved Leo in that. It was the first time I ever got to say that I loved Leo's performance, and maybe even he was the best performance in the movie. Ah, uh, no, that still goes to Jamie Foxx. It probably goes to Jamie Foxx, but, you know, uh, as far... Uh, it was just, for me, it was so big because I never got to enjoy his performance before. So it really shined in that movie for me. It was just... I, I think that's the big problem with Leo. He's cast way too often as the hero. Yes. It, he needs to be somewhat unlikable. He plays unlikable very, very well. Maybe it's, you know, maybe to his own detriment that, you know, like he's a really easy guy to hate. I mean, he is. The dirt. I don't know who said it, but uh, the, the dirt does not cling to the man. Uh, it's sort of, you know what it was? It, it was like, it, it was his performance in Gangs of New York. That's like, what it was. Like him and Cameron Diaz just looked so out of place in that movie. Versus Daniel Day Lewis. <laughs> <laughs> Daniel Day Lewis might as well have been. Uh, he might as well have been from the late 19th century New, New York. Yeah. That was the finest beating I ever took. My face was pulp. My guts was mash. My ribs were pierced. But. But that's a whole other. We got movie. a three hour movie to cover here. <laughs> yeah. And uh, one that we'd like to talk. Are going to like to talk about. I, yeah. Uh, I guess I'll start off with um, what I expected this movie to be versus what the movie is. Go for it. I expected this movie to be as hard sci-fi as possible. I expected that because Nolan is a guy who does not like to stretch his fantasy. Like, he'll have um, science fiction. He'll have science fiction what with the prestige and the cloning machine and um, certain aspects of Batman. But he would never stray far from the path as far as, you know like, recognizable reality. And to an extent, that's what the movie gives us. It's uh, sort of like a detached realism as far as 
what human beings are capable of making technology out of. Like, uh, there's um, very realistic, re believable looking uh, hyperspace pods, you know, like sleeping pods. There's um, like every single spacecraft in the uh, in the movie looks looks like function took over form. Like, fun, you know, form was dictated by function rather than, like, oh, wouldn't it be cool to have a spacecraft that had, like, laser cannons and shit like yes, that? Yes, and everything did not look like an iPod. No, it was grimy, and it looked like everything was held together by, you know, like, <laughs> yeah. lug wrenches and grease. And, uh, yeah. and that was, and that and that lent uh, a good authenticity to the movie. But... Unlike, unlike, um, God, uh, what was that Tom Cruise movie? Um... Oh, you mean Elysium? No, that was uh, not Elysium. That was the no, 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 that, that was Matt Damon. That was Matt Damon. And that was the, actually the first name that came to my mind, though. Yeah, yeah. Elysium. No. Elysium. Oh, you mean uh, uh, like Edge of Tomorrow? No, the one before that. Uh, Mission Impossible. No, after that. Uh, after <laughs> like I'm, I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm losing track of my Tom Cruise movies. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, you guys probably know what I'm like, talking about. Right. Though. Enter just... movie here. Yes. Okay. Uh, I, it's so sad that that's becoming a gag. I know. <laughs> we should be better at this. Yes. But uh, I was expecting a sort of high, a hard edge sci-fi, but, you know, like, loosening the reins as far as, you know, giving movie creative license to bend scientific logic and such like that. Like, when, the fact that they had to use rocket thrusters to get the first spaceship with Matthew McConaughey up into orbit... You know, versus like later in the movie when they're planet hopping and they don't need a rocket boot, you know, rockets to send the ship up into orbit, e even though they landed on a planet with 1.3 times the amount of gravity that Earth has, and yet the spaceship is capable of leaving orbit very good, either is capable of leaving orbit without the need of rockets. So that just, you know, like that felt like. Okay, if the ship can do that, why did you need to waste resources on a, on a resource-starved planet Earth yeah. to get the ship up there in the first place? And that was, you know, like, creative license, okay. I mean, it's much more effective if the, if the rocket ship just, if a rocket carrying, you know, Earth's last hope to find new habitable planets uh, left Earth on a rocket versus just, like, we're off. <laughs> you know, it's, it's not yeah. nearly as dramatic. But, you know, there, then again, you know, dramatic license. And you're willing to forgive the movie for that. But where the movie goes in a direction that I didn't expect it to, which I'm waffling whether or not this was the right decision to make. It makes for an interesting movie, I'll grant you. But it wasn't the movie that I think I was sold on. It, um, the focus of the movie rather, the focus of the movie isn't so much the technology or, or uh, the, the wonderment of going off into deep space to find new planets. It's more about finding the logic within emotion. And I feel that's, you know, that's a heavy criticism that Chris Nolan has throughout his movies. Like, he is, you know, like, he writes characters in his movies, like, human emotion. Like, everything that happens in the movie just feels like it's, you know, needs to be there because there needs to be an emotional anchor. It's not there yes. because it's, you know, the focus of the story. And I think for the first time in Chris Nolan's career, the crux of a human, like a human relationship between father and child uh, takes precedence. And the nature of human relationships is a sort of guiding theme throughout this movie. And whether or not that worked for me, I think is, is whether or not it works for me, I think is the, where I'm teetering on this movie. I didn't stress that part too much. It was, uh, I really didn't. Because the story was really good, and it, it was uh, really... Sure, at times it felt very... Like it felt its length? So, I mean, no, no. It's, it, it's, there, there were times where, you know, it did feel a little bit... Forced? I don't want to say patronizing, but... No, no, no. A, little, a little bit... Uh, expl uh, explainative. Uh, as far as, uh, you know, there are going to be people who don't understand... A thing about the way gravity works, a way about about oh, event horizons, or, or and you're, all that or, stuff. Or you're ta you're talking about like how uh, sometimes the movie will kind of detour a little bit to talk about to talk to explain to the audience how the things work, how how, how, how how gravity works around an event horizon, why you can't see it, you know, all of that stuff. I certainly do not mind that one bit. No, and here, I was getting to that. Mm. Uh, see, I understand why it's there. Uh, for some people, it provides for a little bit 
you know, of a... So they have a semblance of... Yes, yes, we, you know, you know, yeah, yeah. Anyway. But you know why it's there, and it's important that... It's important that a lot of, at least the majority of the audience are on the same page. And, and, and that's a good thing. It, it, it's, you know, people can learn from this movie. Uh, you know, people who don't know uh, about that can learn from it, and that's good. Or at least it get like a, the, like they spark a kindle yes. of interest. And that's always, and that's always great. Yes. But, uh, I, I, kind of going back to the emotion thing, I think that's where the movie fails the most. I think that every time that we go back to Matthew McConaughey, thinking back to his daughter that he left on Earth, is, um, I think that's the weakest parts of the movie. And that's not because of Matthew McConaughey's acting or even the child actress's acting. I think it just feels, it feels like there's two sides of this movie. I agree. Yeah, I feel like there. Like I know what you're getting at. There's two sides of this movie. On one side is that hard edge sci fi movie that we were all, you know, sold on seeing, and they delivered in that regard. But yes. on the other side, is this human drama? That's, you know, what I'm just gonna put the name out there. Contact. Yeah, it 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 had it did have definitely had some brushstrokes of uh, shit. Matt, Matt McConaughey was in Contact. Yeah, what? yeah I think he was. Um, correction if need be here. Uh, now, yes, I could be wrong. I, I believe that he was in that, and he was the, uh, he was the, you know, the the God-loving guy who, or at least, he was the one who was questioning, um, Jodie Foster, if she, do you believe in God? That, he was yeah. the one who asked that question, and yeah, he was I, trying to get her, you know, fired for not, yeah, he's so dumb, but. Yeah, this is, um, this is the movie that I think Contact wanted to be. And I think that's, we, we finally got a movie yeah. like that. Which, again, you know, le leads me to believe that, that this is a great movie, but like... Every its shortcomings are the same shortcomings Contact had. Yeah, and I think in some in, in some respects it's not as bad as Contact. But oh another, god, no. In, in, other, in, like, mm -hmm. in other regards it's kind of no. worse, in a way, because mm -hmm. if, well, one, Contact was not three hours long. <laughs> So, and thank God for that. Yeah, yeah. So, like, it feels like whenever they go, they go back to the human drama. It just feels like it's slamming on the brakes. Yes. And it's not like the, the the setup of the movie doesn't come with its own drama. I mean, sure, the Matthew McConaughey leaving his family behind to ostensibly go out into the unknown breaches of the cosmos comes with it the notion that he might not come back not just because he might die but also because well time is relative to the speed at which it travels and by the time he gets back to earth if he gets back to earth centuries could pass and he'd still be the same age and so like that in of itself is such a unique concept to storytelling and yes. it's one that i i'm glad was they used in this movie and they used it Somewhat properly, but I feel like it was way clunkier than it needed to be, and I felt like there was some, like, human drama bullshit throughout this movie that I don't think was necessary. Yes. Uh, I feel like every time the movie felt like it couldn't trust its own setup to uh, make do with, um, with, to deliver an interesting movie, it, it just pulls that back. It just kind of pulls... Like Matthew McConaughey receiving video messages from his family, and it's been 26 years... But, it's only been like two months for him, but it's 26 years on Earth. And um, even though it's a, a chance for Matthew McConaughey to react and act uh, to the video messages, knowing he can't respond back to them, yeah. it, it, which it makes for an effective scene, I also felt it was like the movie didn't trust its audience. With that, with the explanation and this really like tacked on, I, I've got to say it, it, it felt tacked on, this emotional scene. These emotional scenes like that. It should have been short. Uh, it should have been uh, shorter amounts of it and more punctuated. Yeah, and because the, it, it had its place in this movie. It it did have its place. It's not like the were. Uh, it, it just felt like it wasn't seamless. Yes. It, that's my biggest problem, and it doesn't help with the fact that um, Chris Nolan and his brother cannot write loving dialogue. He they just can't. I I don't know what it is. It's just like. Yeah, like when they're trying to write a movie about human emotions, yeah. and they're like, that's the big crux of the movie. That's the driving force of the movie. That it's not immediately apparent, but that yeah. is the big. Yeah, there was no teary eyes in this movie for me. No, no, and I felt like they during wanted during scenes it. when I felt like I should have. Yeah, like you definitely have those moments. Like, why I should be feeling more than yeah. I'm like I was poking them. I was like, 
Like, why aren't... I need to oil these things up, but I mean, maybe it's been a while. It's like, this should be more effective than yeah. it is. And I think that, one, it, the writing is bogging it down. Because Chris Nolan, God bless you, but you need to really tone down the trailer dialogue. God damn it. Like, it seems that every other line coming from these characters just seems like they need to be in a trailer. Like, like these big emotional sweeps, like, <laughs> like the running theme, the running uh, dialogue theme is that characters will uh, recite the uh, <laughs> Dylan Thomas poem, Dying of a Light. I believe it's called Dying of a Light. Rage at the Dying of a Light. Yeah. yeah I know it's by Dylan Thomas. Rage. At the Dying of a Light. Rage against the light. Michael Caine. Michael Caine uh, says it quite a bit. Uh, I believe at a certain point there was, yeah. Matt Damon says it. He... Yeah, it, it, I didn't like that uh, very much either. I mean, I like the uh, the correlation, but it, it no. it's just wow they overused that yeah. and uh, and and hearing Michael Caine saying that as they were going off into space, uh, into the event horizon or whatever, it did feel like I was watching the fucking trailer again. Yeah, it really did. It, it, sometimes it overplays its hand in that regard, yeah. and uh, the. Like, the dialogue between, like, Matthew McConaughey and his daughter as he's about to leave doesn't feel like a dad talking to his daughter. It feels like a dramatic scene involving a dad and a daughter. It's not natural in the slightest. Yeah. And you can't believe this relationship between them. Even though the actors are selling it as best they can, but it always feels it, like their acting comes with that little asterisk saying, like, these are actors portraying a dramatic scene. It's like there's not a, an actual it's thing It's like there's another dimension between them. I know. It's weird, right? It's like this dimension that we can't yeah. see. That's what it feels like. You know, and maybe that's a, they really got that across us in a way, if you think about it. Yeah, it's I mean, like, if, this... if you want to look at this as a meta narrative, yeah. <laughs> Which you could, actually. This movie is rife with def a lot of ways you could view this movie. You could look, you could take the literal version. Yeah. The literal version of this movie is just, you know, your, your Hollywood epic. Uh, action epic guy goes into space to try and find a new home for humanity succeeds by and large succeeds which is uh, what i thought it was going to be going in i thought it was going to be mo this movie was just going to be like matt mcconaughey and that's it like in gravity with sandra bullock no i i'm glad they didn't take that angle even though matthew mcconaughey mm -hmm. could um all right i'm gonna no, i'm glad they didn't take that angle i'm glad he could I'm, I'm glad the movie. They, but but uh, matt you know maddie mcsee here he could because he has that. I don't know where he found this talent. I know. <laughs> I mean, like, we're living in an age where actors are now surprising, surprising us. Like Ben yeah. Affleck. Yeah. Where the fuck did he get all that talent? I mean, where where was this talent back in two thousand three? Yeah. You know, like Matt McConaughey. Why the hell? Like, when did he get so great? Like, did he like somewhere between like the Lincoln Lawyer and maybe? Um... No, it was definitely around the Lincoln Lawyer that he said like. All right, all right, all right. I guess I should actually take this seriously, shouldn't I? I can tell you where they got it. All this time, it was us. <laughs> it was us all along. Like we the whole time. <laughs> That's the big twist of the movie. All right, we're, let's just drop it on the line here. Yeah. Uh, in no uncertain terms, what starts the plot is that in their house, in uh, Matt McConaughey's house. The uh, his daughter is seeing gravitational disturbances, like books are flying off shelves. But it's tur it turns out that the books are flying off shelves in in Morse code or binary code. Another thing I have a little bit of a problem with, but we'll get to that. Well, so the that's where basically this whole plot starts. It's the fact that there's this gravitational disturbance in the house, or at least in her room. Flash forward to the end of the movie where, the, because of a series of events, Matt McConaughey has to, you know, sacrifice himself and his ship winds up in a black hole. Spoilers and spoilers. Spoilers. I don't know why we bother. Really. I don't know. Like, anyone who watches a vlog review of a movie... Yeah. ...expects spoilers. But I'll put a spoiler in the description and I'll put a spoiler at the beginning of this... Of this because we like the movie enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so... <laughs> you know, Book of Life. Spoilers. Oh. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, so Matt McConaughey uh, goes through the event horizon of, of a black hole, which, by the way, all right, enough creative license saying, like, a guy going through a black hole, like, first off, the ship would disintegrate before... Oh, yeah, I mean, I, I would be like, 
yeah, it's you know you're feeling the weight of a thousand suns. So <laughs> yeah, I, I I think Matt McConaughey would have been like at least his blood would settle and not be able to pump like not even before he could even yeah. have the chance to sacrifice himself to go into the black hole. Regardless, they get sucked to the black hole, and he now has the ability. You know, it's like going inside the you know the black. The black uh, monolith in uh, yes. space in two thousand one, a space odyssey, and uh, he's able to look at one particular instance in the space time continuum, an infinite series of moments, and it is a very visually interesting way of expressing this notion of a rapid succession of moments that spreads throughout history. Yeah, all condensed into one singular moment that he is able to float to, and um, and it turns out that he's the gravitational disturbance that he is sending the signals to his daughter to not only uh say you know get basically get the plot started but also to relay the information that was gathered by having a probe sent through the black hole to solve an equation that will get people off the planet magically regardless it's um <clears throat> excuse me sorry but uh this this notion of uh you know reductive reasoning how did he get the message well he sent him the message but how did he get the message well he received the message that he himself sent to him. paradox yeah it's matt you know you, you created a time paradox snake you created a time paradox don't kill us a lot yeah. <laughs> but uh, you know it's it goes into reductive circular logic but again time travel movie what do you oh you know I, I love paradoxes though i i mean at least when it's structured like this you can be at least it's a little fun to think about but when it's a paradox because of bad writing or like <laughs> or the director not giving a fuck then you, yeah then that's just no but uh the, the movie when it gets to that point like that whole crux that the whole crux of that and you realize that <clears throat> the only reason the only reason why he was able to to divine what he had to do was that throughout the movie they're giving little profundity bombs and dialogue where they're saying like like love allows us to believe that something will happen even though logic dictates it can't it can't happen or it should not happen and uh, it's one of those it's one of those moments where it feels like a, a almost i wouldn't say it goes to care bear levels no. No, it, it doesn't. But it doesn't it, go to Shrek levels. But it does kind of, like, oh, okay, I didn't want this in my sci-fi movie. I really did not yeah. want this notion that love or... That love is a force the, that is integral to space travel. This <laughs> time is space travel. That love in of itself is, like, the fourth dimension. Or yeah. Like, uh, allows the fifth us, element. Was, yes. Yeah, that love is the fifth element. Art! Honestly, that kind of what it was saying in, in, in a way in a roundabout way it, it, and if it didn't intend to it did like the literal version of it is that that love and human connection and human coupling and human uh i guess for lack of a better term human companionship is a the driving force between not only uh understanding the nature of our reality but it also allows us to transcend reality. And in a way, they kind of condemn, uh, you know, uh, instinctual thought. In a way. In a way. It's like they, uh, along with this love, along with this love angle, they also have uh, addressed the issue of the need for human survival. Now, human survival is what sparks the plot. Basically saying, like, we need to leave Earth, so let's leave Earth. But we run into Matt Damon, who was a future astronaut that they sent out, and uh, he's been in stasis until the you know, uh, Matt McConaughey and Anne Hathaway bump onto their planet, and uh, it turns out that he's been faking his data, that the planet that he said was, oh, this is good, you know, real good, it turns out it's not, and he's a coward, he's a shit. and he's a coward. And uh, he almost uh, maroons the entire uh, entire expedition on that icy Hoth planet, but uh, winds up fucking it all up because he was trying to survive. They, they were telling him like, "Don't try to dock on our dock on our spaceship. You're just going to get yourself killed." And he gets himself killed. And um, on one hand, I'm glad he went out like that because that's it does have a lot of 
what what I like to call it, it's narr- it, it it resonates. It it has narrative resonance. Yeah. Like he represents a human emotion of fear and the need of survival and by his own hand and by his own instincts he falls. So there's, you know, there's build up and payoff. What I didn't like about that is that it leads to the most ridiculous part of the film. <laughs> the circle of death where, you know, because yes. of, he blows up his ship and it causes, like, the main docking bay for, main docking bay to go, you know, go around like a merry-go-round. And so Matt McConaughey spins his Space little... Space cowboys! Yeah, you know, it, was, it was, like, the most ridiculous thing in the movie and it was so out of place. Yeah. It was like they needed an action beat there. It was, like, the action beat couldn't have been that... You know, the Matt McConaughey blows up part of the the their only means of getting back to Earth. Yeah, it couldn't have been that, but apparently no, it couldn't. And so we have like this three five minute like interlude with them just trying to l- line up with the docking bay and and sync up. That was so unnecessary and. Actually, uh, Matt McConaughey's line exactly was that it is necessary. <laughs> well, it is necessary if they want to survive. The characters want to survive, but I just thought you'd like to know that he, you know, he doesn't agree with you. Yeah, I know. Matt, like Cooper, Matt McConaughey's character, does not agree that that was necessary. That it was unnecessary. That it was but, unnecessary. But that it was, in fact, necessary. What was the line exactly? Uh, it's like... It's, it's, it's not possible. It's not possible. No, she says, it's not possible, but it's necessary. It's like, you know, yeah, that is. Why? Because it's necessary. And, you know, it's kind of, it kind of harkens back to one of my favorite lines in Metal Gear Solid 2. Uh, the, the line is, you're... you're uh, <laughs> this is spoilers again, but uh, at the end of the game, where you have to fight a bunch of Metal Gears, and Raiden just says... You know, it's impossible. And Snake just says, no, it's not. Why? We can, because we have to. <laughs> and that's a pretty... And, and, I, and I like that line. When something seems impossible, just remember, you have to do it. It's like, well, no, at least you know that there's a possibility if you have to do it. But, again, going off my one of my many tangents. Uh, so, aside from, like, the unnecess- some unnecessary action beats, some unnecessary uh, emotional moments, and poorly written emotional moments, and the little stumblings here with the theme of human connectivity dictating reality in a, yes. in a weird way, like it's the hidden seventh dimension love. The fact that he goes there to that one point in time... It's oh, it's it's everything overlapping though, not just that one point in time. And how do you determine what point in time is more significant than another point of time? You know, it's you're dealing with literally every single moment that has happened in that room, or, or at least in that particular sp- space of the space time continuum. And we only see the room. We only see the room that yeah. you. Because logically speaking, if we were looking at that one space in the space-time continuum, we would have seen like when it was just a field. When it yeah. Was, and that would have been one. It would have been more realistic, but I think that would have confused the audience. I mean, that in and of itself was a not so much a mind-bending moment, but that was definitely a moment that you're not going to see in certainly in Hollywood films, and it's probably one of the most visually unique movies that you're going to see in movies this year. I think that's fair to say. Would you? Yes. Oh, definitely. And uh, it's just when he goes to that one point, though, really, I think that uh, he'd be seeing everything at once, wouldn't he? Yeah, but, I but mean, you're you're not able to perceive it as a you know as the human being he is. But uh, how do you determine what he sees? And it's you know no one can determine that. So they just decided to do something that would work for the story. Yeah, it's sort of like how do you visually represent? a concept that is visually undefinable yes and you know that's in the limits of the human imagination is as such a pastiche of past experiences so you know cre- pulling something out of the creative id that has never been thought of before in the human experience is not only asking way too much it's you know downright impossible and they, they did a pretty good job i i think there was enough of a creative influence where you can just kind of like oh yeah i see a lot of 2001 there yes and and there's and like we said gravity and and uh a bit of um contact in in the visual in the visual sense but it was able to define itself 
in a, it was able to define itself visually, and I think that's another feather in its cap, among the many <clears throat> feathers in the cap. But like, <sighs> how do you how, how do you explain the fact of how much he was able to influence the physical realm? Yeah, you know, it, he's able to like slam against it and go like this sometimes. And he it, can like, make a book fall, or he can like a you know like a poltergeist kind of style thing. You know, like a it really is like a ghost trying to affect the physical realm. And it's very arbitrary in that regard. Like he has like some like he has some physical interactivity with the reality with this reality, but not in others. You would think that, like, if you had that power to look at any instantaneous moment at any point of the space-time continuum, you think Matt McConaughey would just want to see his daughter, or maybe he wants to go, like, to the ladies' locker room. And, like, <laughs> the it's like, all right, all right, all right. Yeah, I know. This, it's like different points in this film where I was like, you know, that ridiculousness of humor really just could... Like, if, if it was anyone but Christopher Nolan directing this movie, you know that there would be, like, the, this... The spark, like, let's have Matt McConaughey just ghost on blow, girls. If you really just... want to blow our minds, do something like that. Yeah, because... Like, like, when you when you said at the... Uh, we were thinking the exact same thing, uh, which is, there's a point in the movie where he that he says, uh, well, they have this running thing about how uh, they're ro they have these robots. Oh, we didn't explain the robots. Oh, dude, yeah. The, actually, I love the robots. I love yeah, the Yeah, I like them, too. Uh, I was a little unsure at first, but then as soon as they started doing those freaking, you know, spin wheel things yeah. and stuff, and I was like, that's really that's really cool in a world where we've come up with every, like, robot possibly imaginable. So, like, it's the, the design of the robot is uh, it's just a bunch of metal cubes held together yes. by magnets. So, like, it's able to segment itself to make little arms or little... Uh, hands to grab a hold onto something, or if they need to move, they'll uh, segment themselves into a, like a little asterisk and flip like that, so that way they're like a cart, they're cartwheeling down. And that's both you know, one. If it's not, if it hasn't been used in film, it hasn't been used to death in film. Yes, and it is uh, very, very, very much a, prag a pragmatically designed. And again, it goes to you know. Uh, F uh, function developing form. Yes, <clears throat> and it, it had a, a old oldie time feel to it too. Yeah, yeah. Kind of like from the you know sixties uh, sci fi clunky robot. It had a little bit of a box feel to it like that. Yeah, yeah. So it was really it was interesting, and uh, so they have this running um, gag or whatever about uh, setting the robot's personality to different percentages, like you know how much they how much they tell the their trust percent. No, it was truth. And uh, how much, how, uh, how many times they lie, uh, or how much they lie, is set to ninety percent or something. Uh, like ninety percent to ninety yeah. percent truth with ten percent white lies. Yeah, and then there's you know humor percentages and stuff, but that's all just fluff. But uh, so later uh, on in the film, um, well, they, they realize that uh, his uh, her father, uh, Anne Hathaway's father, who is the guy Michael Caine, Michael Caine is running the whole thing, and he's. Turns out that he was lying about pro about Plan A. There's a Plan A and a Plan, plan B. B. Plan A is that uh, they get all the all the remaining humans on Earth on like an arc to send them to wherever the habitable planet may be. And Plan B is that fertilized eggs will be sent with the ship to whatever habitable planet they may find, and through uh, maturation and other uh, processes are able to basically fend for themselves over the coming uh, generations. Uh, but it turns out that uh, Plan A, there was no Plan A. That was just a lie to get people to go on these expeditions if they believed that they were doing it for the betterment of everyone. But it was a carefully constructed lie because Michael Caine was unable to figure out this gravitational equation that would allow... Uh, I, they were pretty vague about what this equation will do. Yeah. It, like, it's basically, you know, like the big loose end of a plot thread that needs tying up by the end of the movie. It's Remember, it's like, you know, we're not going to actually come up with the like, theory. Like because, I mean, then we'd actually solve the problem in our real life. Uh, yeah, so... And, congratulations. Thanks, Christopher Nolan. Because Thank of you for solving the problems of gravity. Yeah, we finally figured out gravity. Now we can open portals. And now we can watch the movie and get a full experience. <laughs> and also... <laughs> and uh, also other things. <laughs> Apparently, though, like this... I don't know why I say this like mankind. Whenever we... <laughs> that does sound like something mankind would say in a wrestling promo. You say mankind. 
likes Chris Nolan. <laughs> <laughs> but but this this equation just seems like it's like it's almost like rosebud. It like it's <laughs> it's like this nebulous term that's kind of driving the entire <laughs> movie. But so what it comes down to is that there's a ninety percent factor on that, and he's uh. They, they, he says, um, and they, it, it, there's a parallel between how, you know, telling each other, you know, the truth to get them to go through with things and stuff. And, mm -hmm. um, so there's a point, uh, after the crash or the, not the crash, but the Matt Damon fiasco mm -hmm. where they have to give up a certain amount of their, uh, caring capacity in order to, um, lasso around lasso around the uh, uh black hole the bigger black hole yeah, um a black hole sun gargantua gargantua Gargan yeah by the by the by uh gargantua is nothing like if there was going to be a black hole they need to name it cygnus because that's what that's what uh, scientists call the the most famous black hole is cygnus so you would think that would be a Cygnus ten or Cygnus twelve. Yeah. That's that's sort of the nomenclature that most astrophysicists astrophysicists go by. But again, that's just gargantua. But uh, gargantua sounds cooler though. Yeah, it does. It sounds pretty bad. Yeah. <laughs> but Cygnus is pretty cool. It's like Sigma. You know, Mega Man X fans out there will probably appreciate that one. I'm looking out for you, Mega Man X fans. I'm looking out for you. But yeah, you could, so they have to give up carrying capacity, and uh, at the at the, so they have, they get rid of um, the something in their ship, and they have the robot go out to uh, into the black hole into the black hole, and then right at the last second when they're you know about to go around and slingshot around and the slingshot blade. around, Matt Damon's like uh, you know no Matt not not I'm Matt, sorry not Matt Damon. <laughs> Not Matt Damon, <laughs> Matt Damon, who miraculously, <laughs> miraculously revived himself from being exploded out into the vacuum yeah, he's, of space. He's very, he's a very talented man. Um, <laughs> a talented Mr. Ripley? Yes. That was a Matt Damon joke. Yes, it was. <laughs> Can I just have a, an aside here and just say that, you know who really should have won the Oscar for the talented Mr. Ripley? Matt Damon's thong in that movie. That banana yellow g boy shorts. <laughs> you thought you blocked that memory out, but I just reached inside your frontal lobe and pulled that image of Matt Damon in those tiny boy shorts. Yes. Right to your for Now you can't think of anything else, now can you? Slingshot. <laughs> the Slingshot indeed. <laughs> That's probably what he might have been wearing in this movie. Or that space suit. <laughs> oh, we'll never know. Uh, but uh, but yes, so not Matt Damon, <laughs> but Matt McConaughey. It's two Matts. Uh, he, he's like, hey, you know, uh, I lied. We're we're gonna have to get rid of um, one of uh, the one of the passengers, uh, you know. And he's like, she's like, what you lied to me? It's like ninety percent honesty. And then I and then both of us are thinking the same, same thing. thing. Like. Like, he, he's, he's going to eject Anne Hathaway into the black hole. He's going to Anne Hathaway. No, he doesn't. But, <laughs> but he doesn't. But if he had done that and they hit the end credits, like, he goes, hey, he's like, see ya. <laughs> like, so, uh, yeah. and, that was, and then it's just, pod, you know, it trails out on the the, the, the the pod going off into the black hole with her against the window. Yeah. Uh, and, and then it goes, bomb the bomb, still on bomb, and he hits the credits. <laughs> like, freaking American Werewolf in London. <laughs> no, it... No, what it should have done is like it goes back to Matt McConaughey just looking back as as Anne Hathaway goes in the black hole, turns back around, puts on a cowboy hat, it's like, and then's like, all right, all right, time to find me some space hookers. <laughs> space hookers. <laughs> if they really wanted to blow our minds, that's the ending they should have gone with. Yes. <laughs> because no one could have predicted that. No one. Regardless, the um, actually the one of my favorite scenes of the movie is actually the lead up of the reveal of Matt Damon because Matt Damon has been sleeping inside his uh, pod, waiting for it to be rescued ostensibly, and so like there's this big reveal like who's Doctor Man? Who's Doctor Man? First of oh. all, his name is Doctor Man, so. <laughs> 
already we're kind of giggling because that's a silly name. But yes, so, so yes, we, he's like it's going to be Batman, isn't it? It's going to be it's it's going to be Christian Bale, or uh, it's going to be another Michael Caine. I, I was thinking maybe George Clooney. <laughs> Gravity, maybe Sandra Bullock would have been the funniest. The thing about it, the thing about Doctor Man is that like he was spoken of uh, like almost reverentially throughout the movies. Like Doctor Man's the, the like the most gifted of of all of us. So I'm thinking like maybe it's Chris Nolan in the bat. <laughs> yes. The greatest of us. The greatest of us, exactly. And of course, uh, no, but it, we were not. Excuse me. It was not Matt. We were not expecting Matt Damon. Last of our, last of our mind. Last Maybe not the last, but uh, wasn't I, what I was expecting. Honestly, I was not ex- expecting, and that's another detraction against the movie. Unfortunately, <laughs> because even like nothing against Matt Damon, but I feel like Doctor Man just feels like an unnecessary villain in the movie. On one hand, you understand his motivation because he's a coward, you know, like there you, and he's also the. The representative of human fear and human need for survival and how that's basically killing ourselves and that's you know all well and good but a lot of this movie could have been pared down by either getting rid of dr man or or at least toning it down because i don't think that this movie needed a villain yeah i, I don't think that there the, were a lot of elements of this movie that felt like they were trying to just fill in common you know plot um you know mechanics just you know, to make a you know make a squared squared out movie. Yeah, it feels like there's you know when there was just some deficiencies over one over one area, they kind of filled it in with some other aspect of the movie that either was underplayed before or it was you know com- invented completely just to seal in the cracks as it were. It was balance over composition. I I think that's fair to say. Yeah. <sighs> this uh, this is like the movie works. By the technical definition of how a movie should work, it works because it set out, it did what exactly what it set out to do. Once you understand where the movie was going from, but I think that, despite my feelings, despite my feelings, how I usually keep my uh, my anticipation in check and saying like a movie should be judged by what it's trying to do and how it does them, not like these preconceived notions of how you were sold the movie. Yeah. Because if. I think that's one that's not entirely up to the people behind the movie. That's all up to studios. That's, you know, like how they cut and re-edit a movie to sell it to you. Yeah. Add lines that are not in the movie and add scenes that were not in the movie. And that's very unfair for the film itself. And I think that's... You don't judge a movie by what it doesn't do. You don't judge yeah. any... I don't, th- I don't think it's fair to judge anything by what it doesn't do. Um, but, you know, being a human em, human bot with emotions i feel like i can't escape the fact that i was expecting a different movie than what i got and i can't help but feel a little disappointed by that and i don't want to but i don't want to come come away from this review saying that don't go see interstellar because because however what he did get because you what, did and you did enjoy yeah what i got i enjoyed man <clears throat> but Excuse me. I, I keep coming back to the fact like i just wish uh, hope against hope that there could be like a sci-fi movie that doesn't need to inject this Hollywood emotional baggage. Yeah. I mean, like, like I mean, we've said Anne Hathaway in this movie, but Anne Hathaway's presence feels like it just feels like she's there to be the emotional yeah. resonance. Like, there's no there's no relationship that forms between Matt McConaughey and Anne Hathaway. Thankfully. I, I I was hoping that they would avoid that, you know, like. Oh, well, I mean, the end leaves it pretty obvious that there's going to be though. Well, the end is at least you know it, it, it may hint towards that, but it's also you know it, it's probably like they had to it's like well you know it's Anne Hathaway should hook up with Matt C. I mean, like imagine the babies they'll have, perfect babies. <laughs> <laughs> Eugenics for a brighter future. A wider future. They're going to think we're doing this because it's a good movie, but we're just... No, we're just doing that because we're all about the eugenics. Mm-hmm. Master Race! <laughs> no, you know what? Fuck it. I'm going to keep that in the review. <laughs> Come at me, internet. I made jokes about Master Race. All right. Enough of that nonsense. Uh, I think we need to get down to brass tacks. <laughs> I, we do. We, we need to settle this once, like, put our feelings of this movie on the line. 
I feel disappointed by this movie, and despite that, it still is an enjoyable movie. It's still a good movie. I just wanted it to be great, and it and it didn't and it didn't deserve the title of greatness that I feel like this movie was aiming for. <sighs> the fact that I still liked Guardians of the Galaxy more. No, I was... <laughs> that's not fair. That two completely different movies. It is not fair. It is not a fair. But there is a point where you have to say. In a world where you only have a choice between one or the other being a part of your life, and I would choose probably Guardians of the Galaxy, even though my mind was expanded far more by this movie. I think this is a much more enriching movie to sit through. Yes. I'm sorry, Kevin Bacon Like, fans. I'm a better person for watching this movie than I am for watching Guardians of the Galaxy. And... And yet... <laughs> like, if you, if you could only buy one movie to have in your movie collection... Right. And yeah, exactly. It's 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 guilty pleasure in a way. I, I... And I, I'll, I'll I'll grant you there are worse guilty pleasures to have. I I don't think there I don't think that is a guilty. Pleasure. I mean, I've been watching Cosmos. Cosmos. So mm -hmm. it's not like a that that's missing from my life. No, no. So uh, I didn't really learn anything new from this movie that I didn't already know. But uh, it was affirm like life affirming in a way. It was uh, it, not that Cosmos isn't. I mean, it is, but in a much more practical and in a much more sci scientifically sound way, I, mm -hmm. less heavy handed. You know. Yeah, but I'm. It's in, in an honest way. Yes, that's all. That's always important. Yes. But the thing that we need. To, but I, I think the most important thing to take away from this movie is that art is finally reflecting the. The times that which we're living in, because for a long time we've always used the end of the world as a means to like, oh, would that be great, you know, a spectacle action movie. Mm -hmm. But it's never been used as a, not so much a call to action as it is a call to an understanding of our place in the world. And I think Interstellar does accomplish that in that it makes us think about, well, <clears throat> we all want this bright future. But what are we what are we willing to give up for this bright future? Because nothing is ever gained without losing something. Yes, and I, and they did like you know the they bring up the fact that oh there was a time when uh when I was young that the new th new inventions came out every day every day was like Christmas like John Lithgow's uh, playing yes. Matt Mitt six billion people all every one of them wanting to have it all. Which is, you know, heavy-handed and as as it probably gets. Yes, but it's still a very good message that apparently is not heavy-handed enough. <laughs> no, no, you, it feels like if you're going to be that heavy-handed, at least be heavy-handed about something that is timely and is obviously something that you want to... It may be a heavy-handed message, but no one's listening to it. Yes, it, you, you could you could you could accuse this movie of being preachy in the in that regard, but they don't linger on the obvious dialogue for too long. I mean, it's forgivable. If if you, I will grant you that if you're going to call it preachy, it does somewhat deserve it. But it's not like it's. Let's face facts. It's not nearly as preachy as some of the worst offenders on that list. Ugh. God, like uh, I'm looking at you, Contact. I'm just gonna keep looking at you. Uh, contact legitimately pissed me off. Yeah. Contact. D d d I don't get pissed off at movies very easily, but Contact definitely was one of them. But uh, let's not let's not linger on that. Let's let's. I think it's time for us to close this out. Yeah. Uh, just you know, lay it on the line. Yeah. Good recommendation. See this movie. Definitely see it in theaters. Um, uh, One we, of the best movies this year, if not arguably the best movie this year. I mean, on a, logically, this is probably the most impressive movie we've seen all year, but mm -hmm. I don't think it's going to be, uh, like, maybe top five, possibly top three, but not my favorite movie of the yes. year. Uh, excuse me. Uh, I guess that's a perfect note to go out on. Uh, belch. Uh, another Belch. And uh, see you all next week. <laughs>